am Dr. Molly Marty and welcome to Resiliency Matters. This is where we take the big resiliency research and best practices and break it down into small bite-sized pieces that you can begin using immediately to strengthen yourself and others. What if you could visit with Iowa's winningest coach and learn what she knows now that she wished she knew then as a younger person? Would you spend the next 28 minutes with us? What if in the next 10 minutes you could learn specific strategies to thrive? Would you hang out with us? Who is us, our other half today, my friend and head coach of the University of Iowa women's basketball team, Lisa Bluter. Lisa earned my respect more than a decade ago as a coach and she's continued to earn my respect in how she strengthens youth on court and off court. Welcome. Thank you, Molly. It's great to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you. You know, when I thought about our Thrive model, and we have that on our website, crproject.org, I really wanted to bring the model directly to youth. We do a lot of uh, helping youth builders build youth. And I have seen you um, coach the Thrive model. I have seen you parent the Thrive model. I've seen you live it. So you came to mind as the perfect person to kind of talk directly to youth and bring this to life for them. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, and let's get going. I know. I know your eyes up for a challenge, so game <laughs> on, right? That's right. Game on. <laughs> All right. The first factor, um, trusted adults. Research shows it is the most important factor in building youth. When they're connected to someone who shows they care, that they are positive role models, that they encourage them. How have you seen this play out with your athletes? Well, we have a lot of terrific women that come to our program with already winning mentalities. And a lot of that is because of the role modeling that they've had and, and the, the mentors that they've had, whether it be their parents or whether it be people in their community, teachers or coaches. But then once in a while, there's that individual that comes that didn't have that mentor. Uh, and they've been able to succeed as well. Uh, and so I think having that mentorship is so important for kids though in, 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 uh, in doing well in an environment such as ours where you're really competitive. And I, I love uh, the point that you make that none of what we're talking about today is a, a checklist that a child should look at and go, but I don't have that and I don't have that and that I'll never be successful. It's really a checklist that you want to be moving toward and, and beefing up your resources. Absolutely. Whether if you have the opportunity to have those kind of resources in your life, take advantage of them. Uh, but if you don't, absolutely, it's not an end all, but know that that's something maybe you should be striving to try to get in your life. And, and you have such great advice on this. I've heard you tell young people, find good teammates. What does this mean? To me, a good teammate um, is somebody that is going to support your dreams, somebody that's going to encourage you to go for it, encourage you to be your best and believe in you, believe in your dreams, not tear your dreams down or tell you you're silly for having them, but somebody that's going to push you along, but also somebody that's going to hold you accountable when you kind of stray from your goal or stray from your vision. So the next uh, factor is high expectations. And the research shows that when we have people who expect the best of us and they support us and, and help us get there, that we thrive. Um, how do you see this playing out with your team? I think we have a culture right now of high expectations. And when people come into our program, they feel it. And I don't even think they're attracted to come play for us unless they have those high expectations for themselves because it is such an, uh, a feeling around our program to be your very best uh, all the time. And so I think being around people that have high expectations such as yourself, it raises the bar of everybody, not only the individual, but the entire group is elevated because of that. And I love that. I know we're talking to kids for this first segment, but I can't help but think of those parents and those teachers and those youth builders. And, and you're also saying to them, you can create a culture of high expectations. You can, you can create a space in which kids walk in and they know they are supposed to bring their best. They're expected to bring their best. I think absolutely that we as coaches and, and adults and parents need to have that. We need to make sure that those expectations are out there. You know, I think kids want high expectations. They want to pursue something. And if you don't set high enough expectations for them, they're going to get bored. Uh, they're going to become very, you know, bored with that and not be driven. And so I think as adults and as mentors and as coaches, it's one of our responsibilities to raise those expectations and to get kids excited and motivated to achieve what they didn't even think they could achieve. I love it. So one tricky part I think that kids can get tripped up on is accountability. It's easy to find friends if they're encouraging you and cheering you on, um, but we don't always want to be held accountable to making 
good choices. What does that look like? In my opinion, accountability is a two-way street. Um, you have to be willing to hold your teammates accountable and your teammates have to welcome that feedback. Because if they don't welcome it, they're going to stop getting it. Uh, you know, if, if your teammate holds you accountable for do, doing something on the floor, for example, since I'm a basketball mm -hmm. coach, you know, if, I, if one of our teammates asks another teammate that they need to rebound better and they kind of blow them off, they kind of, you know, roll their eyes at them and walk away, well, that teammate's not going to give them that constructive criticism anymore. and It's going to break down the chain. Uh, so you have to not only be able to give it to your teammate, you've got to welcome it and understand that teammate is trying to make you the best that you can be. So I think holding each other accountable and accepting accountability is something that's really tough for young people to do. Nobody likes to tell one of their peers that they should be doing something different or you know, maybe that they can be doing something better. But at the same time, that's what elevates a team. That's what makes a team really, really strong is when you have that belief in each other that you're helping them out because you believe in them. So that attitude, you're saying to kids, have an attitude of being open and welcoming people, getting you better, better invested Absolutely. in that. Absolutely. And it. if you don't welcome that, people are not going to give you that con con you know, constructive criticism, and then you're going to stop growing. Right. Okay, so the next factor, resiliency building. Um, we are helping kids grow strength. We're helping them uh, cope with adversity. Self-care is a big piece of this. How about with your team or with young adults? What, can, what choices can they be making to take care of themselves? Well, it's essential in my field. Uh, as, as a coach uh, of highly competitive athletes, self-care is instrumental. If they're not taking care of themselves, how can they possibly come to a three-hour practice and perform their very best or go play on the road in a Big Ten environment and expect to get their best if they're not taking care of themselves? And taking care of themselves could mean so much from uh, eating properly, uh, hydration, which we really stress at the University of Iowa, taking your vitamins, but most importantly with young pe people is getting their sleep. They neglect to get their sleep, and um, I think that's one of the worst things for, for kids especially. They need to have that. They need to be able to be strong on the floor, and without those things, uh, they're just not going to be able to be the best athlete they can be. Good advice, kids. I know you're young, but you're not immortal, and you need to take care of yourself. So wrapping up our first segment, Trusted adults, find your best teammates. High expectations, embrace being held accountable to being the best you can be. And resiliency building, refuel often and move toward meaningful goals one step at a time. How can you strengthen yourself by contributing to others when we come back? Dr. Molly Marty and welcome back to Resiliency Matters. Today we are visiting with Lisa Bluter, head coach of the University of Iowa women's basketball. We are talking about how kids can thrive. We've been through trusted adults, high expectations, and resilience building. The next factor is involvement. This is about kids connecting to others and contributing to them. Um, your team is known for this, the service component. What does that look like with your team? You know, it looks like a lot of different things. And, you know, sometimes people say, well, why do you get involved in the community so much? Why is it important, you know? That's, that's team building and that's enjoyment. We, we really grow as a team when we get involved in our community. And uh, some of the things that we love to do, we love to do the Habitat for Humanity Women's Build, which is every fall. We love to go into the schools and talk to the kids about leadership and reading and the importance of that. Uh, healthy lifestyles. We really enjoy, probably the favorite thing we do is going to visit people in the hospital, great Hawk fans that are there at the University of Iowa hospitals that we can go and maybe brighten their day and take a, a, a few minutes to take them, their minds off of what they're facing. And you've been coaching a long time. Do you have a specific uh, memory or, or something you've seen where a, a player was really changed by that experience of contributing or maybe a favorite team memory? You know, I think the great takeaway for our players is when they go see some kids in the hospital is how fortunate they are, mm -hmm. how blessed that they are to have their full health, especially in what we do in, in using our bodies to perform on the floor. Um, they walk away very thankful, very grateful. Uh, when they go in and speak to kids in the community 
for them to understand that they're role models and that they can have an impact on kids and use their platform as a women's basketball player to maybe encourage somebody else to, to, go, to uh, have high dreams and expectations. So just a lot of good things come out of the uh, community service. And on the performance end, of course, my, my performance psych mind is going and, and thinking, and that helps them play better on the, the court as well. So it, it will help the kids watching this do better in school and uh, be better at home and be better with their friends. And it, it's all connected that way. Well, I think there's, there's no doubt that the things that we do off the court help us on the court. Um, and again, le great lessons learned, but also those are team building activities that are very, very enjoyable and very fulfilling when you leave there you feel good about it. So if there's a young person watching us right now and they are thinking, wow, I, I don't do anything outside of school. I'm not doing anything in the community. Where might they start? Or do you have any ideas? Oh, I, just, I think it's so easy to get started. And I think that's one thing about volunteering is that I think by nature, we're not born as volunteers. We're, we're not born into somebody that just wants to automatically share and give, and we learn those things. And I think volunteering is the same thing. We learn that. And so you just need to jump in, because once, once you start, it becomes contagious, and you want to, you, you get the joy from helping other people, so you want to do those things. So jump in with something easy. I'm sure every school has an opportunity of some sort that you can get involved with. Great. The next factor is vision, and I've heard you encourage young people to be unrealistic dreamers. Tell us about that. You know, I just say, you know, be an unrealistic dreamer because I think people set their dreams too low. And why not have unrealistic dreams? Why not just blow people out of the water? I think that's how you achieve real greatness is by having high dreams and then going for it, but nothing is too big. And th I think that's how it all starts, is with that unrealistic dream. And so it it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to think about what you can accomplish and have those unrealistic dreams. And I know you're sitting here as someone who was told you will never get a scholarship to mm -hmm. play uh, college basketball. There were a lot of people that doubted your capabilities as a very young sure. Hawkeye coach. Right. So you, you've lived this. Absolutely. I, I can remember um, when I was in high school, and setting a, a dream, and this was, you know, six years after the passage of Title IX, so this was, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of women's scholarships back then, and I remember I set my dream to have a scholarship, and I remember even some mentors and some older people coming up to me and saying, oh, you know, that's pretty, pretty unrealistic dream, it's probably not going to happen, you know, and, and a year later, I was at UNI on a scholarship playing basketball, so I think you also have to be wary, again, uh, of people that are trying to diminish your dreams and take those away from you. Uh, you can't listen to those people. I think that's really important. Uh, but yeah, you know, when I, when my first coaching job, I was two years older than the, than the women that I was coaching at St. Ambrose uh -huh. University. That's kind of unrealistic to think about being a college coach at the ripe age of 24, uh, but I did it. And uh, so I, I'm just so fortunate that I had that opportunity and I, I went for it. That's, that's a good message there, go for it. The research on, on vision also talks about hope and the importance of having hope for a better future. You are a coach, so your team has built in adversity. How do they keep that hope alive that they, they'll get the next one, that, they'll, that the future is better than what they're feeling right now? Yeah, and I think one of the lessons um, I've learned from you, especially Molly, is you know when you look at a, a, a loss or it, it, it's a one-time thing. Look at it as a one-time thing. It's not a regular thing. It's, it, it happens once in a great while. I mean, in competitive sports, there's always going to be a winner and loser, and obviously mm -hmm. we want to win a lot more. But I think one of the great things about athletics is it teaches you how to deal with failure. It teaches you how to get back on that horse and go again. And that's how we feel as a team after a loss at Iowa is – some people may be like, oh, you don't want to go to practice next day. We can't wait to get back to practice. We can't wait after a loss to get back on the floor, have that next opportunity to redeem ourselves and to go out and show what we are really capable of doing. So I think that you've helped me with that and understanding that this is just a one-time thing. You know, get, move on from that. So I, uh, yeah, today's failure is today's failure is how I kind of say it. And, it, and you are not a failure. Uh, so a good message good for the point. kids as well. Yeah. Uh, it, it doesn't define you. It defines what happened today and, and turn the page and move on. Right. So, and we right. can learn so much from our failures, mm. too. And I think people sometimes forget that, that that the easiest learning often comes from our failures and going back and really analyzing what went wrong, how can I improve? And so 
failures can actually be beneficial for you in the long run. And that's a great segue to enrichment when we're talking about enriching and growing um, holistically because, um, and you've kind of referred to this, but athletics teaches you a lot of life lessons. You're talking about some of them, but what do your athletes get that go well beyond the court? There are so many lessons I believe that my players learn from being on the basketball court that you can't learn from reading in a textbook or you can't learn from sitting in a class at the University of Iowa. I mean, I think that they learn things about goal setting, discipline, motivation, working as a, as a group, working with a team, you know, how to bounce back from failure, how to win with grace, um, how to hold each other accountable. There are so many lessons that, you know, those are not basketball lessons, those are life lessons that are gonna help you perform well the rest of your life. And these aren't just limited to athletics. If we have a student watching us and they said, but uh, athletics isn't my thing. You know, I've always believed that, you know, athletics was my thing. So mm -hmm. it's real easy to talk about all of my examples in an athletic terminology. But, you know, if, if you're out for band or if you're out for theater, you can learn these same examples because you're part of a group that's trying to achieve excellence. And that's all that athletics is. It's just a, a, a group that's trying to be their very best. Well, isn't that what every band is trying to do or every theater group or debate group as well? And I, I'm involved a lot with the Girl Scouts, and I always tell the Girl Scouts, because I know not every one of them can be a star athlete, mm -hmm. but every one of them can be a Girl Scout and be a part of that group that's learning those valuable lessons that you learn on the floor. You can learn those when you're a part of a high-energy group that's striving to be its best. And um, you show a slide when you talk about comparisons, and it's a lighter slide, I love it, it cracks me up. <laughs> um, but it's a really pretty serious message you have to kids on uh, keeping the focus on you and not comparing to others. What's your message to, for yeah, them, Coach? I think females, especially young teens, are really do a lot of comparisons. They compare themselves with their peer groups all of the time. And I think that slide is funny because it just shows you, you know, how silly really some of these comparisons are. We shouldn't compare ourselves with, our, with other people. We need to be our best, the best that we can be. The best, I always tell them, be the best you you can be. Don't, you, you can't compare yourself. There's always somebody better. You look at our team this year, we finished this season ranked 19th best in the country. I think that's pretty darn good. Well, if you compare us to UConn, was that the only successful team in the United States because they won the national championship? Not in my opinion. I think we were a very successful team this year, even though there were 18 teams that finished above us in the rankings. And I think there's probably some that finished below us in the rankings that were even more successful than we were. It's being your best, not being somebody else's best. And to that I say go Hawks. I, I agree, <laughs> very su successful. So here is the takeaway for our time together, involvement, vision, and enrichment. Coach Blitter had great advice for you on those three factors. What's the secret to challenging others to be their best in a way that doesn't overwhelm them? More tips and advice when we come back. I'm Dr. Molly Marty and welcome back to Resiliency Matters. We are visiting with head coach at the University of Iowa women's basketball team, Lisa Bluter. And you just went through some tremendous advice to help kids thrive. We, we covered a lot of ground in a short amount of time. I want to circle back to trusted adults. And for the students watching, stay with us. You can uh, listen in here. But I think of everything you covered and what I'm seeing, the tough balance for parents, for coaches, for teachers, is how do I challenge kids and support them and challenge them to be their best and support them. And, it, and it, it's a leadership skill that I've seen you develop and continue to get stronger and stronger with. Um, I'm gonna share a little research, you know, I'm a little research geek and <laughs> this is the research on um, positive leadership and it basically shows that negative emotions, they hit deeper, people glom onto them more, we have a negativity bias. Uh, those words just hit harder when they're negative versus positive. And you've experienced this. We've talked about that. Um, one study examining management teams found that the most important factor in performance was the number of positive statements to negative statements. And those who routinely made positive statements, uh, appreciation, support, helpfulness, um, compliments, significantly outperformed those who had the negative comments, um, dissatisfaction, cynicism, uh, criticism, um, or who used more neutral language. 
They came up with numbers. The highest performing teams had a ratio of over five positive statements for every negative statement. It was a, a 5.6. The average teams had a ratio of 1.85 to 1, so about two positive phrases for each negative one. And the lowest performing teams had a ratio of 0.36 to one, so for every positive statement, um, there were three negative statements made. How have you found uh, the role of positive statements, positive coaching, playing a role in the development of your players? Yeah, in, well, you've just given me something. I'm gonna make sure I'm going six to one for every uh, <laughs> positive uh, to constructive criticism type comment with, when I'm coaching, but I have I found the same thing with, with coaching, and especially women. I think women really harbor uh, those negative comments and really hang on to them a little bit longer. Um, but when I was uh, doing some graduate work, I even, this was a part of one of the studies I did was I taped myself during practice. How many times I was giving positive comments to how many times I was giving constructive criticism. And I, I, I can't remember the exact numbers, Molly, but there was, sl there was more positive than negative. And mm -hmm. then I asked the team afterwards and asked them what they felt and they felt there was more negative to positive. So the players were hearing more negative things even when I was saying more positive things. And so I think that's a, just a good reminder to us coaches that we've really, we got to double what we're thinking. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we really have to strive for that six to one balance in order for them to hear the good things. And I'm so glad I invited the youths to stay tuned on this section because that's consistent with all of the research on when you ask parents and then you ask kids, um, for example, how comfortable are you talking about this topic and that topic? And there is such a differential where parents say, oh, my kids are very comfortable with me uh, talking about this and this, and the kids are maybe 20, 30, 40% lower about their actual comfort level or how much they um, you know, think that their parents actually talk to them about important issues. And so there is that differential and, and something, you you know, if you've learned nothing else from coaching, I know you've learned this, perception is reality. Yeah, perception is reality. And so if those kids are thinking that they're hearing those negative comments, they're going to walk out of practice, you know, feeling down. And so really our, our coaching staff strives for positive comments, co positive feedback. Now, of course, we have to have constructive criticism. That's coaching. That's mm -hmm. helping them get them better. But at the same time, you can always find something positive to say to a kid. And you can take this too far. I, I don't want parents to say, oh, well, I'm just going to be um, all positive and all good, and there goes accountability out the window. Uh, the follow-up study showed that there is kind of a boomerang effect, and the marker was 13 or more positive to one uh, negative. When it went to 13 or higher, um, it created low accountability environments where people actually weren't confronting challenging situations, and it led to mediocrity. So we do need to find that balance. Kids are smart. Uh, <laughs> kids are smart, and they can understand when you're feeding them a line. And uh, I think that if you know, you're not sincere or if you said good job on doing something when they really didn't work hard at doing it, you know, good job studying for that test, and they didn't study for the test, I think that's sending a really bad message to them because now they're getting praised for something they didn't do. That's confusing, counterproductive. So we have to make sure that what we're telling them is, is very truthful, actually, in, in based on fact. It's a great ending point with you. you like, like I said, you coach with integrity, you parent with integrity. You're saying stay real with your kids and, and be honest, but be specific in helping them get better. There's our wrap up for our last segment. I guess tool number three would be uh, keep a positive attitude and show your kids you care with that honest feedback you're giving them. Let's review the Thrive model. Um, trusted adults, high expectations, resilience building, involvement, vision, enrichment. Find out more information at crproject.org. This is Dr. Molly Marty with Resiliency Matters. Thank you for joining me on MediaCom MC22, your pro local programming leader.